Hello everybody, this is Jacob Martinez from theactmatrix.com. Um, I don't think it's any question for people who know me um, to say that I love The Matrix. Um, I have a whole website about The Matrix. I've dedicated my life to The Matrix. I'm making this video right now about The Matrix. I use it with every single client that I work with. And I really do think that it is one of the best tools for teaching acceptance and commitment therapy, but also the idea of just functional um, thinking, functional behaving, analyzing function of behavior. And I love the thing. I think there's maybe two people on earth that love the ACT matrix more than I do, and they might be named Kevin Polk and Benji Schoendorf, and then it's me. So even saying that, uh, as much as I love the matrix, it is not perfect. There are plenty of things about the act matrix that are a little bit wonky and that I think limit its widespread appeal, even though the matrix does have widespread appeal. It's used all over the world. There are a few things that can be confusing for people about the matrix which has led me to create my own version of the matrix, which I call the, the survival vital matrix or the SV matrix. I've written about it extensively on my site and I use it in videos and things like that. So this video here is just kind of a rationale of how I got to the SV matrix from this standard matrix, which you're looking at right now. So this is a standard act matrix. It's got toward on one side and away on the other, which creates four boxes here uh, with that vertical line, which actions are on the outer end. That's anything outside of your body, external experience. And then underneath the horizontal line is any kind of inner or mental experiencing. So this is how the traditional act matrix is, is usually set up. The language, however, of toward and away can create several different misconceptions which hinder the matrix itself. And we're going to go through those here right now. So let's strip everything away. Let's just talk about the horizontal line. That's all we're going to be focusing on. The vertical line is this whole other thing, I, I know. Um, but we're just going to focus on the horizontal line for right now. The first misconception that comes with the standard act matrix is the language of toward and away as they are used in English are framed in opposition to one another. I cannot both be moving toward my coffee table and away from my coffee table at the same time. So almost always when you're using the word toward or the word away in English, you, you mean that, that it's an opposition to the, to the other. Toward is opposite from away, away is opposite from toward. However, in the act matrix, it doesn't work that way. Away is not in opposition to toward. Away means moving away from unwanted or uncomfortable inner experience and toward means moving toward what matters. So this first misconception right off the bat sets us up for several other misconceptions because it can become confusing when we, uh, we are thinking one thing and the person we're doing the matrix with is thinking something else. The first or the second misconception coming from uh, the misconception of opposition is that the act matrix is no different than the choice point that they're exactly the same, they just look different. That is to say that toward means moving toward values and away means moving away from values. And you'll see this all the time. Lots and lots of people see the matrix, they see the choice point, they say, what's the difference? A lot of clients as well view the matrix this way and a lot of therapists and clinicians who are using the act matrix are actually using it like the choice point. They're working with clients and toward means toward values, away means away from values. 
which does work. I mean, it, it, it creates, you know, um, some good, you know, results there. But if you're using the ACT matrix in this way, it's actually uh, reducing the efficacy of the ACT matrix. You're, you're missing out on a lot of the subtlety and complexity of the matrix by reducing it just to this concept of toward values and away from values. Now, even if the therapist or the clinician understands what toward and away mean from the matrix point of view, the person that they are doing the matrix with may not. They often have this misconception. So clients, even that I work with, will come to me and they're talking about the matrix and they, they talk about it in these terms, toward values and away from values, or toward what matters to me and away from what, what matters to me. So even as the clinician, you have to kind of work around this misconception all the time with clients. The third misconception, again, stemming from the language issue, which is oppositional, is that away moves are bad and toward moves are good. That everything we do on the away end is negative. And we don't want it. We want to get rid of it. And everything we want to do on is on the toward end. We want to increase those behaviors and decrease the away behaviors. This is a very big misconception, and obviously the ACT matrix um, shouldn't be used that way. What the ACT matrix is aiming to do is help us identify function, analyze function, and, and see how the behaviors that we are making are working for us in our lives. So what we're trying to do with clients ideally is helping them reduce ineffective or unworkable away moves and increase workable away moves and decrease unworkable toward moves and increase workable toward moves. So there's no value judgment at all here in the matrix. But again, the language of toward and away sets us up to think that one is better than the other or that one is more preferable than the other, that we're trying to move from away moves toward, toward moves, but that's not the case. The fourth misconception is that away moves are always aversive and toward moves are always appetitive. Appetitives are things that we want more of or that we want to get closer to. Aversives are things that we want less of or that we, that, or that we want to move away from. You'll even see people train the matrix this way. Instead of putting toward and away on the horizontal line, they'll put appetitive and aversive or S plus and S minus. Now, this is fine because generally this is the case. However, this is kind of like a, a mile in the sky view of the matrix. When you're way, way, way up distant looking down at the matrix, you can see that towards are generally appetitive and aways are generally aversive. However, when you zoom in and you're actually working with clients, you can see that in the moment, in, in real life, the away side and the toward side have plenty of aversives and appetitives on both sides. Moving toward what matters to you is often very aversive. Moving away from discomfort is often very appetitive, right? That's, that's literally why we do it, is because it works in the short term. There are certain inner experiences that are more aversive than others. There are certain, um, cert certain inner experiences that are more appetitive than others. So we want to keep this in mind rather than just viewing away moves as aversive and toward moves as appetitive because we want to see the complex interaction here. When we zoom in and we're working with clients and we're seeing these appetitives and aversives in play, we can use that to help shape the behaviors that, that will lead toward more flexibility. So in reality, um, 
a way and towards in a matrix are not in opposition. Ideally, you know, a rabbit can move away from a dog and toward a carrot at the same time. So that's the thinking that you can be doing an away move that moves you toward what matters, or you can be doing an away move that doesn't move you toward what matters. And then in some rare cases, you can be doing a toward move that actually moves you, um, I guess, away from your inner experience as well. So this is tricky because, again, just linguistically, in terms of the way we use the words away and toward, it's just hard to kind of think of this. Plus, it's got that straight line with an arrow on each end. Um, so visually, the metaphor doesn't quite you know, fit the bill. So that's the, kind of the main problem, the main difficulty with the standard act matrix. This next thing that, that I'm going to talk about is, is mostly just me. It's on my end. But I, I also think that the language of toward and away falls apart in certain situations. So let's take a look at the matrix here again. Every once in a while, you'll run into a situation where away and toward don't quite function the way that they even are supposed to um, here in the matrix. So we've got who and what are important to me down here in the lower right-hand quadrant, thoughts, feelings, and other inner stuff that gets in the way, actions that move me away from the stuff below, actions that move me toward what matters. So let's do a quick example of something that, I, that I've seen that has kind of, kind of broken the matrix, or at least the language. It doesn't break the function of the matrix. It still works. It just doesn't feel quite right. So let's envision um, a man and a woman who are married. And yes, I'm sorry for being heteronormative, but um, I need to for this example. Let's just imagine that, that a, a man and a woman are married and the husband's in counseling, and he's doing a matrix, and what is important to him is his wife and having a loving relationship. But what gets in the way sometimes for him is his desire for sex. You see, he has a much higher desire for sex and would, it, it would enjoy much more frequent sex than his wife would. So he's got this high libido and this high desire for sex. And so what does he do with that? Well, in response to that, he ends up hiring sex workers, um, viewing excessive pornography, and then he feels guilty about it. And then it, it becomes this whole thing. So that's easy to imagine, right? And then if you went one step further and you completed the matrix, you would see on the toward end, uh, maybe he could communicate with his wife you know, differently. Maybe he could, he and his wife could experiment with ways to appropriately satisfy, you know, his sexual needs together in a way that would not um, break their commitment to one another. So this is kind of a way that you would fill out a matrix for, you know, with a client who is coming to you with this problem. But it's just this idea that the desire for sex here well, one, it, it's not um, maybe not an uncomfortable or unwanted feeling. In the context of, of uh, his marriage, it's, it's not necessarily wanted. But the thing itself is, is desirable. Um, and then the, the actions that he's doing, right, is he really viewing pornography and hiring sex workers to get away from this stuff down here? Or is he really kind of moving toward the desire for sex by doing these things? So I know this is kind of nitpicky. It's, I'm, I'm splitting hairs a little bit, but I, I've never been able to kind of get around this problem. And it only works with some things, and it, it, it doesn't work with other things. Um, so for example, if, he, if we replace sex here with hunger, um, so you can imagine a situation where hunger or you know, wanting to eat 
gets in the way of your life in some way, right? It gets in the way of your, your personal goals or whatever. And so when you're hungry, then you might go to the kitchen, you open the fridge, you grab something to eat. So when you do that, you're moving away from the hunger, you could say, maybe toward um, fulfillment, feeling full. So that, that works, that passes this away language test. Um, but something like this with, with the desire for sex never quite passes that test for me. So I know that's kind of a, just a, that's, that's mostly a Jacob thing. Uh, but in, in any case, um, I don't like it. So I, um, I'm trying to create a new language for a new horizontal line and I have done it. I, I created it a few years ago and I've been using it consistently since then. And I really enjoy it. So let's go back to the regular matrix here. We've got, you know, who and what are important to me in the bottom right. Thoughts, feelings, memories, urges, other inner stuff there in the away side. And then actions up top. But if you look at just the away side for a second, you start to see that these things that are showing up on the inside and the stuff that we do in response to those are actually just related to survival. You see, thoughts, emotions, memories, and sensations are evolutionarily built into us as a species. They, they help us survive. And any action that we do in response to those thoughts, emotions, memories, or sensations is related to survival in some way, either historically within our own life or evolutionarily. And so even within this context here of thoughts, emotions, memories, and sensations, you can see that they kind of come on a ladder. All organisms that are living have sensations. So even the most basic organisms have some kind of sensation. They can feel or they can, they can tell the difference between light and dark. And then as you become more complex, you, you develop memories. So even plants and things can have some rudimentary, what we might call memory. Other organisms, they can, they can recall. When I say memory, I just mean kind of, um, kind of a, they can keep track, they can count things. So if you think of like a Venus flytrap, a Venus flytrap, if, if it's got its like mouth open, right, waiting for a fly to come in, if it feels a little something um, stimulate it, it'll snap shut. But it can't it can't just snap shut for every single thing because it, it, it expends too much energy doing that. It, it wants to only snap shut when it knows it's got a bug inside of it. And so the way that a Venus flytrap will do that is instead of one stimulus uh, triggering that snap shut response, it needs you know, a, a few different like little pokes, right? In other words, like if you were a fly landing inside of a Venus flytrap, as your legs are touching the Venus flytrap, you're hitting it one, two, three, four, five, right? A few different times, the Venus flytrap kind of feels that and snaps shut, but that's kind of time dependent. So that there's, there's some kind of mechanism within the Venus flytrap that says, I've only been touched once in the past amount of time, that's not enough for me to, to snap shut. And there's, there's, an, there's something there that says, I've been touched this many times within this window of time. In other words, it, 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 can, it can keep track of something there. So anyway, I digress. Memories are sort of the next thing that, that develop in complexity for a species. And then emotions are the next thing that develop in complexity for a species, and then finally, complex thought, which is us, that verbal behavior. Uh, so far, we're the only species on Earth that, that has that complex verbal, verbal behavior. On the other end, on the toward side, we can see that all of these things here, who and what are important to me, and actions that move me toward what matters, 
are actually things that just help us live a vital, meaningful, and fulfilled life. So we can kind of conceptualize this as vitality. These are actions that, that, that add this sense of vitality to life, right? And they make us feel fulfilled, meaningful, like we have a purpose. We feel vibrant and expansive. And then we can lop off one of the arrows, right? On the survival end, we can just chop that thing off and we can make it a point because that point is birth. From the moment you're born, at that certain moment, all you care about is surviving, right? You can't, you don't really have the capacity. You have sensations. You're going to have memories here in a second. Um, you have emotions and you don't have quite complex thought yet. But that's the point. So we, we can kind of see it's on a, on a continuum. From birth to death, our aim as a human being is not just to survive, but hopefully to add a sense of vitality to our life as we live. If we could die you know, at 100 years old, we would hope that by that point, we had lived a vital and meaningful life rather than just survived, just scraped by. Now, this is really cool because now we can kind of get rid of this idea that only things that, that the only thing that goes in the left uh, bottom hand quadrant is uncomfortable, unwanted, negative thoughts and feelings. That's that's a fragment from the uh, opposition framework of toward and away. Rather, any any kind of thought, any emotion, any memory, or any sensation has some kind of survival function. Uh, in other words, we we evolved these things to help us in some way. And now all of those things are wrapped up in verbal behavior, since we are um, able to derive relationships arbitrarily. So if, if, if a client kind of comes to you with a thought or something, you don't know exactly where to put it because it doesn't quite fit in an away side and maybe it doesn't quite fit in on a toward side in our traditional act matrix, we, we kind of tuck it down here because it's, it's in some way, way, way back, you know, millions of years ago since it's a survival thing. And then we can easily see how survival things can be appetitive or aversive, and things that make our lives vital can be appetitive or aversive as well. So for example, um, on the survival end, eating food, right, is a survival thing, the act of eating itself. Now some food that we eat is aversive to us, we don't like it, some food that we eat is appetitive to us. Things can be on both ends of the spectrum. It's, it's a kind of a, a flexible continuum. It's not one or the other. Eating food, uh, let me see if I can go, yeah. Eating food here um, is a survival thing, but we don't just eat to survive. We eat to bring a sense of vitality to our lives. We eat with people, we eat socially. We eat food that, that makes us feel good. And so the same action can be on either end of the spectrum or both, depending on how it functions for you. And that's the whole point of the ACT matrix. That's literally what we're trying to do with clients is help them sort out how our behavior is functioning for us, whether it's Something as simple as, you know, um, you know, just scratching my head like I just did right now, or something as, as huge as, you know, uh, making a, a big life decision, deciding to change careers, right? Am I doing this because there's just a sense of wanting to survive, wanting to wanting to kind of, you know, make enough money just to just to live, or am I doing this because it really adds a sense of vitality to my life? So here's a really beautiful example of how we can um, kind of
kind of shift from survival to vitality. Right now, everybody who's watching this video, including myself, uh, we're breathing. Breathing is a survival thing. If we don't breathe, we'll die. But none of us, well, uh, maybe perhaps very, most of us are not aware of our breathing. And we haven't been aware of our breathing as we're watching this video. And I know I haven't been aware of my breathing. So what I want us to do together is, as you're listening to this, I want you just to take a second and I want you to connect to your breath and your power to choose. And I want you to, on your next inhale, I want you to breathe in with intention and purpose. I want you to choose to breathe. And you can choose how long you want that breath to be, how long you want to hold that breath, and how long you want to let that breath out. Just keep choosing to breathe. Let yourself have that choice. So you might have noticed here that by reconnecting to your power to choose and to notice, you can, you can take something as simple as breathing, which is just a survival thing, and you, you add some intentionality to that and it shifts over to this beautiful sense of kind of vitality. It adds something to your life. So now we see how, you know, a lot of people that we work with, their, their matrix kind of looks like this, right? They've got a lot, a big area of survival stuff going on, but their, their, their vital living is kind of, um, squeezed, it's, it's kind of blunted, it's off kilter. So we, what we try to do with clients is we just try to kind of put that line back up straight so that we have a good balance between kind of what is helping us survive and also what is making our lives vital and meaningful. So that's the survival vital matrix and that's my rationale for it. And I think it passes the tests that um, have plagued the ACT matrix, the traditional ACT matrix. You can use it in much the same way that you can use the traditional ACT matrix. I haven't run into any situation that doesn't work with it. I actually find that it's much more helpful to use this matrix, the SV matrix, to help with psychoeducation, to help with... Um, validating clients to help us self-compassion to understand those links that that these patterns of behavior that we're wrapped up in um, sometimes aren't our fault and to reconnect to that power to choose and to notice so thank you very much for watching this video uh, again my name is jacob martinez you can go to my website it's theactmatrix.com for more information about this matrix and the regular act matrix Thank you.